record. Okay. Um, so uh, it's, it, it's also my privilege to introduce Dr. Scott Fitzgerald. So Dr. Fitzgerald is a professor and veterinary pathologist here at MSU. And, and um, I'd also like to introduce Dr. Travis Brendan, who's a professor and the co-director of the, the Michigan State University Quantitative Fisheries Center here. So, so both of them are currently serving on Courtney's graduate committee. So, so thank you again for, um, for doing so. So before I, um, before introducing Courtney, I wanted to provide a, a brief roadmap for her defense today. Um, so this first portion um, is when Courtney will be presenting some of her findings from her thesis research. And this is the, the public portion of the defense. Um, once Courtney's finished with her thesis presentation, uh, then we'll have time for questions from the audience. And then around 11 or so, the public portion of the defense will conclude, um, at which time Courtney, Dr. Fitzgerald, Dr. Brendan, and I will continue with the next phase of the defense, which is a, a closed door session for further in-depth discussions of, of Courtney's thesis. So that, that's sort of the roadmap for today. Um, so hopefully you're as excited as Courtney and I are for, for this. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce the star of this morning's defense. So um, just a little bit on Courtney before I turn the, the reins over to her. So prior to becoming a Spartan, um, Courtney received her Bachelor of Science in Animal and Nutritional Sciences from West Virginia University. And then um, she joined the Conservation Fund Freshwater Institute in Shepherdstown as a research intern where she was involved in a range of aquaculture and um, water quality related projects. So I was really thrilled to be able to recruit Courtney as my first my first official master's student. So this is also a special day for me because Courtney's my, my first master's student. Um, so since joining my lab, I really have nothing but, but high praise to say about Courtney. She's, she's the consummate team player in the lab. She's an excellent, excellent and patient student mentor. Um, she's re resilient in the face of curve falls. She's exceptionally driven. She's passionate about her research. She's kind, she cares deeply about um, all of her lab mates. I find that she always consistently raises the optimism in a room and, and she's really become quite adept at a lot of, um, a lot of uh, diagnostic and clinical techniques that we use in aquatic animal health. Um, so you may not be surprised to hear that just as I recruited Courtney to MSU a short time ago, she was once again recruited to um, Auburn University as a, as a PhD student. So that's set to begin in 2022. So, um, so very, very proud of her. So anyways, before I take all morning with my singing my praises for Courtney, um, I'll, I'll close by saying that I'm really proud of you, Courtney, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Tom, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in this morning. Um, I'm excited to present some research findings on one of the most important fish species in the Great Lakes, the Lake Whitefish. Um, specifically, I'll be talking about um, their recent declines in recruitment because scientists still don't understand what's causing these declines in recruitment. And with my interest in aquatic animal health and infectious diseases, for the past three years, I was able to investigate the role of infectious diseases um, in these declines. And when I say infectious diseases, I mean diseases caused by pathogenic microbes, including bacteria and viruses. So a lot of work has been done, and I won't be able to cover everything that I've done um, these past three years, but I will be able to provide some highlights for you. Let me just get my laser pointer ready. And... Okay, so let me introduce you to the Great Lakes Lake Whitefish. Scientific name is Corrigonus clupeiformis, and it's one of the few truly indigenous salmonid species in the Great Lakes. And it's believed to have been around since uh, the glaciers carved out the Great Lakes to be in fact. And you can see by its downward uh, pointing mouth that it is a benthivore, so it helps cycle energy from the lower trophic levels to the higher trophic levels of the Great Lakes food web. And it's also one of the most commercially important fish species in the four lower Great Lakes. And so here's Lake Whitefish commercial yields over time. So you can see here on the x-axis is the year of harvest. And then along the y-axis is uh, the millions of kilograms of harvest. 
And so you can see by these peaks and valleys that their numbers have fluctuated substantially over time. And they reached an all time low in the 50s um, due to a variety of reasons, but with better management practices, their numbers did recover. However, since the early 2000s, their numbers have been declining again, and they're continuing to uh, present day. And not only are these declines in adult abundance, but we're also seeing declines in poor early life stage recruitment. And so this is what I'm trying to tackle. So what is recruitment? Simply put, it's the introduction of new individuals to a population. That means that eggs need to be released and fertilized, they need to hatch, and then the fry need to survive to join the adult population. So having declines in recruitment of lake whitefish is concerning, again, because we don't know what's causing these declines. And um, this has been the focus of many previous studies. Um, and these studies um, include looking at possible contributing factors such as habitat changes, ice coverage, water temperature, food web changes, water levels, invasive species, but there's still nothing conclusive. And it's likely um, multifactorial. And so we see a range of abiotic and biotic factors potentially leading to a stressed host and potentially leading to suboptimal environmental conditions. And this presents um, the opportunity for pathogens to do their most damage and to cause disease. And so disease as a factor in poor recruitment has not been thoroughly investigated. And so that's my focus here. So what you're seeing is um, previous studies of infectious diseases in Great Lakes Lake Whitefish, um, but these were all focused on adult Lake Whitefish. And so what I'm showing you here is almost the extent of what we know of viruses and bacteria that affect Great Lakes Lake Whitefish. And these studies are important because they highlighted the presence of pathogens in Great Lakes Lake Whitefish. But whether these pathogens are causing disease and or mortality in adults is not completely understood. And what is yet to be investigated is if these pathogens have been detected, that is if these pathogens that have been detected in adult Great Lakes Lake Whitefish are also present in the gonadal tissues of spawning fish. Because if they are present in the gonadal tissues, um, does that lead to infection in the eggs? And then if the eggs are infected, does that persist to infection in the sac fry? And likewise, would those infections persist into later early life stages? But above all else, what are the effects of infectious diseases and what do they have on the health and survivability of lake whitefish? And so for all of those reasons, this is what guided the formation of my overarching hypothesis which is pathogens that are transmitted from adult lake whitefish to their progeny are contributing to declines in recruitment of young fish to Great Lakes populations. And so to address these unknowns, I tackled three primary objectives. The first, which was to look at wild adult lake whitefish to understand what infections and diseases were present in their populations. Second, I wanted to know if juvenile lake whitefish populations harbored those same infections and diseases that were found in the adults. And last, if infections and diseases are present in wild lake whitefish populations, I wanted to understand their effects on health and survival, and mainly the ability of infectious disease of these infections to cause disease and or mortality in lake whitefish. So first I'm going to focus on objective one. So in order to do that, I focus on analyzing spawning phase um, adult lake whitefish. And so I indicated earlier that they were suffering for um, from poor recruitment. However, that's not the case everywhere. And so I worked closely with Mark Ebner and based on decades of data, we selected sites in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron um, to look for intra-lake comparisons. So that means that one site was associated with good recruitment, um, which has historically high biomass and abundance of Lake Whitefish, whereas the other is associated with poor recruitment. So less overall biomass and abundance, and then evidence of fewer early life stages of Lake Whitefish. And then Lake Superior is historically considered to have good recruitment. So it's not necessarily a control, but it did allow us to look outside of those paired lake comparisons. And so in collaboration with charter boat captains, I collected 60 fish from five sites twice over a period of two years. So um, I collected a total of 600 adult lake whitefish. 
and I transported them alive back to our laboratory in live wells. And so for each one of the 600 fish, thorough internal and external clinical exams were performed. And I also collected a range of tissues ranging from um, different organs and utilized them for bacterial and viral isolation. Additionally, I collected samples of the gonads because no studies have looked there before. And if there's a presence of infectious agents in the gonadal tissues, it makes the risk of infecting offspring much higher. Okay, so for virology, I use multiple cell lines at multiple incubation temperatures that support the recovery of a range of important fish viruses. And likewise, for bacteriology, I use multiple media types um, at, multiple, at multiple temperatures that allow me to detect a range of fish bacterial pathogens. So now I'd like to share some results fr um, from objective one. So to assess the prevalence of virus infections, I use three cell lines at multiple incubation temperatures. So when a virus is present, it induces these cellular effects, which, which is what we call um, cytopathic effect. So for all 600 fish and tissue samples that went onto these three cell lines, at no point was there evidence of a virus being present. So these samples were deemed um, negative for virus isolation. So now I'd like to provide some highlights and some notable findings um, following bacteriological analyses. So during field studies and clinical examinations on the 600 fish, a subset showed clinical signs of disease, including this one here. Um, you'll see this fish has some multifocal ocular hemorrhaging. And I also saw some severe hyperemia of the swim bladder vasculature. And here you can appreciate the thickening of the swim bladder wall. And when I opened up these swim bladders, I found this mucoid turbid fluid. And so I took cultures from that fluid and I recovered this bacterium and at high intensities. And I should also note that I recovered an identical bacterium from the kidneys, swim bladder fluid, and the gonads of fish, so, fish showing signs of disease. So after I verified the culture purity, I performed phenotypic and biochemical characterization on several isolates collected from multiple fish. And in all cases, this bacterium was gram positive, oxidase negative, and catalase negative. And I also ran a battery of other tests, um, which I won't get into at this point, um, but I was presumptively able to identify the bacterium belonging to the genus Carnobacterium. And so then I PCR amplified a partial stretch of the 16S RNA gene. And according to percent similarity, it was most similar to Carnobacterium ultramaticum. And so then to get a confirmatory identification, I then performed phylogenetic analyses. So here you're seeing a neighbor joining dendrogram that I constructed. So it contains um, all of my isolates collected from adult fish um, compared to all described Carnobacterium, um, all described type strains of Carnobacterium. And so the shape and the color depict what year and what site they came from. And so according to this analysis, I could de definitively identify my isolates as Carnobacterium ultramaticum because they fell into this robustly supported clade that contained the type strain. But how prevalent were, uh, were these infections? So here I'm showing you Carnobacterium ultramaticum infection prevalence in adult lake whitefish. So the prevalence is along the y-axis and um, the site where fish were collected is on the x-axis and it's separated by lake. And so a white star denotes that it's a good recruitment site whereas a black star denotes a poor recruitment site. So first let's look at these paired lake comparisons. So in Lake Michigan, um, during both years, there was always a higher prevalence of Carnobacterium infections in Bailey's Harbor, which is associated with poor recruitment, whereas the bacterium was never recovered from the good recruitment site in Menominee. And then when we look at Lake Huron in 2018, the prevalence of Carnobacterium was twofold higher in the poor recruitment site of Alpena compared to the good recruitment site of Saginaw Bay. However, in 2019, the prevalence was the same. 
And then in Lake Superior, I found infections to be higher in 2019 than in 2018. So carnobacterium and other salmonid fish causes a disease called pseudokidney disease. It's also known to cause post-spawning mortality, and it has a penchant for the gonadal tissues. So finding Carnobacterium ultramaticum in like whitefish is concerning because based on my work for the first time, this bacterium can be present in the gonadal tissues of fish approaching spawning, meaning that the potential risk of transmission from infected parent to offspring exists. Okay, so likewise, a subset of fish, including some showing clinical signs of disease, I recovered this yellow pigmented bacterium. And based on initial biochemical characterization analyses, it looked to belong to the genus Flavobacterium. And more specifically, I suspected it of being Flavobacterium cycrophyllum. Then I utilized a specific endpoint PCR and found that yes, indeed it was Flavobacterium cycrophyllum. But how prevalent was this bacterium? So here's the prevalence of Flavobacterium cycrophyllum in a similar format, but notice here, and unlike in Carnobacterium infection, I only recovered Flavobacterium cycrophyllum um, in one year, and I only found it in good recruitment sites. So nevertheless, this is a significant finding because this is the first detection of Flavobacterium cycrophyllum in Great Lakes like whitefish. So why is this so significant? This bacterium causes a disease called bacterial cold water disease and rainbow trout fry syndrome. And as the latter name applies, it causes substantial losses of early life stages in, in other salmonids. And there's conclusive evidence that the bacterium is transmitted intra ovum from infected parent to offspring and other salmonids. So in the context of poor juvenile recruitment of like whitefish, finding this bacterium is highly significant. Okay, so I know this image may be a little daunting, but just bear with me for a minute. So since this is the first detection of Flavobacterium cycrophyllum in Great Lakes Lake Whitefish, I wanted to see how it related to other strains. So in doing that, I um, used multi locus sequence typing, which shows just how related strains are to one another. And so by multi locus sequence typing, I can see here in red that all of my isolates are unique to all previously described type strains. And so some of these strains have a specific host preference. So does that mean that my isolates I collected have a host preference to Lake Whitefish? I can't say for certain at this time, but it is something to think about and it requires additional studies. Okay, so to better understand the role of diseases and declining recruitment, I also wanted to look at wild juvenile Lake Whitefish populations. So I went to beaches adjacent to adult spawning locations where I collected the adults. And so you're probably wondering, does this mean that fish from these sites were coming from the adult population I sampled? I'm not necessarily saying that, but I did have to look at both the adults and juveniles as close as, in as close proximity as I could get. So I collected um, juvenile fish via beach seining, and I worked closely with folks at Michigan um, Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Division, United States Fisheries and Wildlife Services, and Bay Mills Indian Community. So we did multiple hauls up and down the shoreline and we morph morphologically ID'd um, juvenile like whitefish. And then I placed them into coolers with aerated water and transported them live back to our laboratory. So in some sites um, in 2019, I was able to get my target number of 150 juvenile like whitefish. Um, ironically though, in 2019, I was able to reach my target but only in the poor recruitment sites. But in the three good recruitment sites, and at least in one case, I was only able to collect one lake whitefish. And then in 2020, and because of COVID, I couldn't collect any juvenile lake whitefish that year. But in 2021, um, because things were still a little bit dicey and I couldn't get to my originally planned sites, so in correspondence with Fish and Wildlife Service um, from Green Bay, I was able to get fish from Marinette, which is as close to Menominee as I could get. So I was able to collect a total of 436 juvenile lake whitefish. 
So similar to the adults, I collected kidney, spleen, and heart for virus isolation. And when fish were too small, I collected um, their viscera. And I also collected bacterial cultures of kidney tissue. And so I use the same approach as adults, and I put samples onto three different cell lines at multiple temperatures. I didn't observe any cytopathic effect, so all samples were considered negative for viral infections where viruses are capable of replication on these cell lines. So in contrast to virology, I collected a number of bacteria belonging to different genera. And in almost all cases, they were present in mixed cultures containing um, two to three morphologies and of low intensities. So that compared with the condition of the fish upon arrival to our laboratory, it makes um, interpreting the significance of the presence of these bacteria difficult to determine. And of note, I did not detect Carnobacterium multramaticum or Flavobacterium cyprophyllum from these fish. So to this point, based on my study and previous studies, as I mentioned earlier, um, there have been um, serious pathogens detected in adult Great Lake like whitefish. But can these infections actually cause disease and mortality? So, to a way, so a way to assess this is under controlled laboratory challenges and to see if the pathogen elicits disease and or mortality. And so that's what I said to do with this objective. So the gold standard is using Koch's and Rivers postulates. So briefly, and using fish as an example, this means that a, suspect, a suspected pathogen must be isolated from a diseased fish. That same pathogen is used to induce disease in a healthy fish. That pathogen must be re-isolated. And then a pure culture must be identical to the original pathogen. So that's what I sought to do with these experimental challenges. So in collaboration with the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Wadawa Indians, I received juvenile like whitefish. Eggs were artificially fertilized from wild brood stock originating from Elk Rapids in Lake Michigan. Eggs were disinfected with iodophore and water hardened with erythromycin on site. And then once again, they were disinfected with iodophore before entering their hatchery facility. And so once they hatched, they stayed at their hatchery facility for about three months. And then they were transferred to our laboratory and held under quarantined conditions in a UV treated water. So as I continued to maintain these fish and I was about to initiate challenges, COVID hit <laughs> and thus halting research and all um, experimental challenges temporarily. And so in the process, my fish continued to grow. And unfortunately in October of 2020, I started to see the development of disease signs. So I started seeing um, some linear ocular hemorrhaging I also noted some severe exophthalmia in these fish. And then I started seeing more severe ocular hemorrhaging. And as things progressed, I started noticing more chronic signs of disease, like lenticular and corneal opacity, and then corneal perforation. So I began to deploy in-depth and clinical diagnostic analyses in order to diagnose this problem. So following virological analysis, no viruses were detected. And at the same time, I was looking for bacterial infections. And so I took bacterial cultures of the kidney of these fish. And because so many fish were showing signs of exophthalmia, I also took bacterial cultures of the eye and the brain. And in many instances, I was getting these pure intense bacterial infections um, like you're seeing here from this picture. And I recovered these infections from the kidney, the eye, and the brain, thus indicating um, a systemic infection. And so again, using the same approach as adults, I performed bacterial analyses, and I presumptively identified this bacteria belonging to the genus Carnobacterium. So then I PCR gene sequenced and, phy and performed phylogenetic, phylogenetic analyses. And guess what? All of the juvenile isolates clustered once again in the same clade as the adult isolates, meaning that my isolates from the laboratory mortality event were indeed Carnobacterium multramaticum. So ultimately, when mortality stopped, I was left with the cumulative mortality um, ranging between 25 and 32 percent, meaning that this disease outbreak resulted in substantial mortality. And at this point, I knew I couldn't use these fish for challenges. 
And so about two weeks um, after mortality stopped, I sampled an additional 120 fish, and I found a prevalence of 5% of carnibacterium infections in these fish. And the infections were found within the kidney, the eyes, the gonads, and ascites of infected fish. Again, suggesting that this may be now a persistent infection. So I obviously didn't plan for that, um, but I did learn something. So Carnobacterium multramaticum is associated with mortality and serious signs of disease in juvenile like whitefish. And I found Carnobacterium infection in juveniles, even though the eggs were disinfected. And so remember, now we know that Carnobacterium can be present in the gonads of adult like whitefish just before spawning. Does that mean that these infection, that these, uh, that this bacteria persisted from infections in adults that were transmitted to offspring at spawning? So due to unforeseen circumstances, I sought to try again in 2021, not only to fulfill Koch's and Rivers postulates, but also to determine the median lethal dose. So the median lethal dose is a, a routine metric used to assess virulence of an infectious organism. So in this case, it's the concentration of a pathogen that induces 50% cumulative mortality in an exposed population. So pathogens used for these challenges were pre-selected before I knew what I'd find in the wild adults and juveniles. So Aramona salmonicida subspecies salmonicida is a causative agent of a disease called furunculosis. And because it's been found in adult like whitefish with signs of disease previously, this pathogen had been prioritized. Likewise, viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus has also been found in adult uh, Great Lakes like whitefish, also associated with the signs of disease. And some of you may be familiar um, with this, but the virus emerged in the Great Lakes basin in the early to late 2000s and spread throughout the Great Lakes and caused mortalities in a range of fish species. And for those reasons, viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus, virus was also prioritized as a focus for in vivo challenges. So here you're seeing my um, laboratory experimental challenge layout with new fish. Um, so I exposed fish to one of five doses, including a negative control. So that was five fish per tank and in triplicate. And I did this by immersion exposure to replicate a natural exposure to pathogens. Okay, so now I'm gonna show some results from in vivo challenges with Aramona salmonicida subspecies salmonicida. So first I noticed some disease signs, including uh, bilateral exophthalmia. And shortly after I noticed um, some shallow multifocal hemorrhage um, along the lateral aspect. And soon that progressed to focal hemorrhage ulceration that penetrated the underlying muscle, which eventually um, became deep cavitating focal hemorrhaging. So in these fish, the bacterium was capable of inducing disease, but what about mortality? So as you'll see, um, the days post-infection are along the x-axis and cumulative mortality is along the y-axis. So yes, the bacterium also induced mortality in exposed fish, and it happened in a dose-dependent manner, um, where the highest mortality occurred in the highest dose, and the second um, highest mortality occurred in the second and then third highest doses. Um, no negative control fish died, nor did any fish from the two lowest doses die. So in fulfilling Koch's postulates, I needed to re-isolate the pathogen and confirm it was the same microbe that I exposed the, these fish to. So in all cases, I recovered the bacterium with this morphology displaying a brown diffusible pigment, which is characteristic of um, Aramona salmonicida subspecies salmonicida. So then I ran a PCR assay specific to the bacterium, and in all cases, it was Aramona salmonicida, thus showing that this bacterium is capable of inducing disease and or mortality in exposed juvenile like whitefish. So using the method of Reed and Munch, um, the, the median lethal dose of juvenile like whitefish exposed to this bacterium was estimated to be 3.6 times 10 to the five colony forming units per milliliter. So when one thinks about Aramona salmonicida and furunculosis, one thinks about the species most susceptible, which is Atlantic salmon. And its median lethal dose is 1.8 times 10 to the three CFU per mil. 
and then rainbow trout are considered amongst the next susceptible with a median lethal dose of 9.5 times 10 to the four CFU per mil. So we can see that juvenile like whitefish are fairly susceptible to Aramona salmonicida. Okay, so now I'm gonna show some results um, from in vivo challenges with viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus. So quite rapidly, I started seeing signs of severe septicemia. Um, I saw fish with bilateral exophthalmia and severe ex extensive ecumenic hemorrhage um, on the dorsal musculature. Almost every fish had severe gill pallor. Some had uh, severe renal and perirenal hemorrhaging. And in some cases, some fish um, displayed severe ecumenic hemorrhage of the swim bladder. So does VHSV induce disease in juveniles? You bet, most definitely, and severe signs at that. But how about the ability to cause mortality? So I thought that lake whitefish were highly susceptible to Aramona salmonicida. Well, lake whitefish are extremely susceptible to viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus. So mortality has occurred in almost every challenge dose, um, or sorry, every challenge dose, and mortality, um, being dose dependent for the most part. So that means that the highest doses experience the highest mortalities at nearly 95% mortality. And you can see how rapidly mortality began, began on day three and took off by day five. So yes, viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus induces disease and mortality in juvenile like whitefish. And in every fish that died, I was able to recover that replicating agent. So followed by PCR analysis, I confirmed that I recovered viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus from each dead fish, thereby fulfilling Rivers postulates. But how susceptible are these fish to this virus? So before I get to that, and as I mentioned earlier, when viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus emerged in the Great Lakes, a lot of effort was put into determining what fish species um, were most susceptible to the virus. So here you're seeing fish species susceptible to this virus under laboratory conditions. So prior to my studies, two Great Lakes fish species considered to be the most susceptible, um, including the lake herring with a median lethal dose of 3.8 times 10 to the two plaque forming units per milliliter and muscalunge um, at 1.7 times 10 to the four plaque forming units per milliliter. And so based on my research, it appears as if juvenile like whitefish are amongst the most susceptible and if not the most susceptible fish species tested to date, which may be a very significant finding as we know that viral hemorrhagic septicemia is widespread throughout the Great Lakes Basin. So to summarize all of these findings, I found some serious pathogens detected in adult like whitefish that were nearing spawning. I also found a serious pathogen in the gonads, um, meaning that there's a risk for pathogens to transmit from parents to their offspring. And in some cases, these infections of pathogens were almost always more prevalent in poor recruitment sites than in good recruitment sites. And the study also shows how some pathogens previously detected in adult Great Lakes like whitefish can indeed elicit disease, and in some cases, elicit significant mortality in juvenile like whitefish. So coming back to the bigger picture, and as I mentioned on the outset, a lot of studies suggest um, abiotic and biotic factors may be leading to potentially suboptimal conditions here in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, also, there may be some of these factors that are leading to stress in uh, the Great Lakes like whitefish, which could be causing them to be susceptible to infections of pathogens. In this case, pathogens recovered previously in adult lake whitefish are those not yet detected. So is there the potential for um, infectious diseases to contribute to declines in adults and declines in recruitment of juveniles? Yes, to which a degree remains to be determined. So at this time, I would like to thank the Great Lakes Fishery Trust for um, funding this project, all the fishing boat captains for their help in collecting fish, um, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources Fisheries Division, United States Fish and Wildlife Services, and Bay Mills Indian Community for helping me collect the juvenile like whitefish, the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians for supplying juvenile fish used in experimental challenges, all of my colleagues at the Michigan State University Aquatic Animal Health Laboratory, Mark Ebner, 
uh, Dr. Travis Brendan and Dr. Scott Fitzgerald and my advisor, Dr. Thomas Locke. At this time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Courtney. And uh, virtual virtual round of applause. Actually, I'm brain malfunctioning and can't find my oh, there's my reaction button. <laughs> but you're getting you're getting lots of virtual applause. Um, so as as Courtney said, so now is the time where um, anyone can can ask Courtney questions about about her research. And if you can. Um, so let's let's go with the raise your hand function. And if you're if you're unfamiliar with that, um, that would be under the reactions button. And if that's not working, go ahead and uh, you can enter your question in the chat. So we'll try and do this um, in order in which I, I see the questions come up. So I, I see Dr. Brendan has, has a question. So Dr. Brendan, please. Hi, Courtney. Um, what's the current status of VHS in the Great Lakes? I mean, where, yeah, is it still circulating? I, I don't recall hearing about, you know, recent outbreaks in, um, you know, here on Michigan or Superior. Um, yeah, the, yes, do, you, do you know the status? I, I don't know of the current status, but the, the last um, studies to be done, um, it did detect, again, like it was widespread. And I think the most recent studies were in like 2012. So, um, so almost a decade ago. Um, and at that time, it was widespread throughout the Great Lakes. Um, and, and just to, to round that out a, a little bit, Travis, um, we are, it's not, it's not as frequent as maybe when it first emerged, but we are still seeing pretty regular VHS outbreaks in, in gizzard shad um, predominantly. It, it sort of varies by year. Um, but, okay, so I see, I think next, next up was doc, is Dr. Fitzgerald. Good job, Courtney. So you got your juvenile lake whitefish for your studies from the Bay Mills Indian tribe. And tell me, are, are they, collecting these from the wild and trying to rear these to increase the uh, numbers in their area? Or was this just something that they had access to and were willing to help you out and they're not really rearing these things normally? Nope, so um, so the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians does have a, a fish hatchery and they regularly um, collect gametes from Lake Whitefish brood stock and raise them to stock into um, Lake Michigan the Lake Michigan watershed to help restore their uh, their population. Okay, so I, I see uh, Maury has has her hand raised. So go ahead, Maury. Thanks. Um, great job, Courtney. Um, Thank you. I'm curious. It's a, it's a shame you weren't able to do another year of juvenile collection along the shores because I was just yeah I was struck by the fact that your your good recruitment sites like you weren't able to collect any. So I guess, is there any concern or insights? Like, are those sites actually good recruitments or are trends for some of those sites changing? And I'm curious if you have any insights. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I found um, from, from these in-depth studies and some of the information I wasn't able to present to you today, but I collected uh, morphometric data on adult lake whitefish um, so length um, and weight. I also collected um, some blood parameters. So uh, packed cell volume, which is a good indicator of um, like a stress response or anemia in fish is a good indicator of like overall health. And I also collected the visceral fat index, um, which again is a good indicator of uh, nutritional status in these fish. And these results can be compounded. So it seemed that it, it varied throughout the year. So my thought is, is that maybe, you know, in 2019, um, juvenile fish that came from these, you know, these lake white fish that at that year um, were not performing or were not as nutritionally like adept or um, healthy. 
Um, maybe, maybe that's why these juvenile fish weren't present. Um, maybe at that time, viruses and bacteria had, you know, infected these fish and they weren't around to be collected at the time. It's hard to say um, why I didn't find as many fish. And, and ironically, I found so many fish in the poor recruitment sites that I've, I've seen from um, data that I collected that like all of this varies by year. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I saw, uh, Ted, you had your hand up next. Please go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, nice job, Courtney. Um, it's great to Thank see you. fish that we collect uh, being used for multi purposes. Um, I had a yeah. quick, I don't know much about fish health, that kind of thing. So I'm kind of new to this, but I'm interested to hear what do folks think is the bigger threat to whitefish recruitment? Is it the, the carnobacteria or VHS? Do you think, you know, I'm looking at the, the lethal dose curve for VHS was pretty scary. And I look back at that curve kind of showing the the harvest over the years and looking back at when VHS showed up in the Midwest in you know, 2005, 2007. And that's kind of at the beginning of a pretty precipitous decline. So, I'm, but I'm wondering, you know, are we setting ourselves up for a double whammy? You know, or is this the reason why we're seeing all these declines and we're chasing ghosts and trying to find other reasons? Um, just wondering what your feelings are. Yeah, thanks. Um, good to see you again and great question. Um, I mean, my study, has really been the first of its kind because before this, we had no knowledge of infectious diseases in juveniles. And, um, you know, there hadn't been any in vivo laboratory challenges in juvenile like whitefish that, uh, that I'm aware of. Um, so these, so my studies definitely shed some light on um, the risk of these pathogens um, infecting wild populations and, that they could be contributing to declines. But again, there's it's not conclusive at this time, but it is possible. Thanks. Okay, so, Thank you. All right, so Art, I saw your hand next, so please go ahead. Hi, yeah. congratulations Courtney. Very nice uh, uh, work done over those um, um, years. Um, so I would like to ask you um, if the pseudo kidney disease uh, caused by Carnobacterium montaromaticum is also seen in other uh, um, fish species in the Great Lakes, particularly, for example, coho and the Chinook salmon or other. So Carnobacterium? Yeah, the pseudo kidney yeah. disease. Yeah. Yes, it has been. It has been um, detected in. Uh, other salmonids in the Great Lakes Basin, um, specifically those that, and some that have been, um, have been detected from Michigan uh, weirs, so uh, wild adults coming back to spawn. Um, so yes, it is present, and um, and to my knowledge, it is widespread throughout the, the Great Lakes Basin. Um, so it can infect multiple salmonid species. What about other non salmonid species? Any? I don't know of any. Um, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Thanks a lot. Congratulations again. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, Bart. So, um, so Courtney, we have a couple of presentations, or sorry, a couple of questions in the chat. So, first one is, um, Great presentation. What is slash are the gene targets for your PCR bacteria identifications? Um, so I guess I can use um, Carnobacterium as an example. So I've ran, um, actually ran three different PCRs. Um, the first one, um, I targeted the 16S um, RNA gene. Um, just like a, a partial stretch of that, just to determine like if it was a bacteria. And then I targeted that intra, um, uh, another uh, region um, on that same gene um, to determine like the variability of it. And then I targeted the, um, the Pisa colon 126 gene. Um, so, Kaya, does, does that answer your question or, or were you looking for any, any more details? Uh, all right. Uh, okay, let me. 
Okay. Uh, so how uh, how sure you have the uh, I mean the uh, single uh, bacterium in the pure culture. So how you purify your culture to make sure uh, there there are no mixed bacteria in your yep. sample. Yep. So uh, we routinely do this in our laboratory. So um, I have that primary culture um, and I, uh, I then subculture it onto um, the same uh, medium. And I look at it under a dissecting scope and I look at the morphology, make sure it's not mixed. Um, I look to see, I count how many colony forming units are um, there and um, Yeah. Uh, so, you, so you got good result on your uh, sequencing uh, products. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? So, uh, how about the? So you got a good result on the sequencing. Yes. Yes. Yep. I I always verify the culture purity before running any sort of molecular analyses. All right. That's. Like you said, that's pure culture thing. Yes, uh, yeah, it was a pure culture, yes. All right, okay, that's good. Excellent, good Good question. So um, so next, Courtney, we have a question from Kevin Donner, management implications. If we determine that these diseases are having widespread and substantial impacts in the wild, what tools do managers have to address the issue? And then secondarily, what should hatchery managers consider when mitigating the risk of these pathogens in captivity? So those are two very great questions. Um, so the first one, let me just, so if they're having widespread, uh, what tools do managers have to address the issue? Um, well, I mean, there have been um, like novel vaccine developments that have been used in terrestrial animal populations. So this is a little far from, um, you know, being, being conducted at this time, but this study, at least, like I have these bacterial isolates and they can be used as a resource for um, potential um, vaccine development for prevention and control of, um, that are widespread in the wild. And secondarily, um, I mean, hatchery managers should consider, you know, the median lethal dose of, you know, ASAL and um, viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus that were found in these fish. Um, because it's, you know, when they're, especially when they're being considered for hatchery propagation, because you can see that they're highly susceptible. Um, so if for some instance, they do come in contact with another fish species, you know, being raised um, in the same hatchery and there's some cross-contamination or something and they become infected, I mean, it can wipe out their population pretty rapidly. Um, so having, you know, the quantity of the bacteria that I discovered from these studies will be very beneficial to hatchery managers. Good and and so Courtney, I'm gonna I'm gonna press you a little bit more because Kevin asked a really good question on the management implications. So um, yeah, I agree with you that that um, vaccine development is could potentially be. I mean, it's being used against rabies and you know being deployed more frequently in, in the wild and herd immunity does occur in in wild populations, right? But mm -hmm. I, um, I think what Kevin was also asking is what else could could managers potentially do? Like let's say let's say you have, you have your data, how, how could your data be used if it wasn't gonna be sort of like an applied in terms of vaccine or, or something along those lines? Is there anything else you can think of? Yeah, it could be used um, for future recruitment models. Um, so I don't know what all goes into these future recru into recruitment models, but I do know that natural mortality um, is analyzed. So infectious diseases, um, or at least death by infectious diseases could also be um, included in this natural mortality that can be used to forecast, you know, like, okay, like this, this year, you know, in, in 2021, we had a bad 
saying hypothetically that, you know, viral hemorrhagic septicemia was like raging in the Great Lakes Basin. Well, what does that mean for juvenile like whitefish in the following year? If it's also, you know, if it's also, you know, a, an issue in the following year. So I feel that hatchery managers could use that information to forecast future recruitment models of juvenile like whitefish. Thank you. So um, I see. Uh, Bart, is, did you have another question or is your hand, or is that from before? All good? Okay. All right. So I see you have, we, Courtney, you have a question from Dan, Janice, and that is any plan to see whether multiple exposures of these diseases may increase survival or natural immunity? Multiple exposures of these diseases. So we haven't planned on that, but that is, that is a good suggestion. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question, Janice. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, so are there, I, I don't see any more questions in the chat. We still, we plan to have the general, general session closed by 11. So we do, do still have time for additional questions. If not, um, no problem. I, I, may, I may take this opportunity. I, I think I'm supposed to hold most of my questions for the closed session, but Courtney, I'll, I'll ask you one um, because I think your findings for VHS are, are potentially significant. As Ted said, you know, that does sort of these declines of recruitment do semi line up with when VHS emerged. And again, like you said, you're not necessarily saying that this caused the declines, but could be playing an important role. So I guess what you showed with your study under lab conditions is that the fish uh, that, that the amount of virus needed to, to elicit 50% mortality is pretty low, right? 53 flag forming units, mm -hmm. right? 53 copy, 53 virus particles. Mm -hmm. So can, what, how does that line up with what you know about um, shedding rates? It, so like in, in fish that are infected, um, like what would be a, a typical amount of virus that might be shed from an infected fish? It could be, from what I know, it could be from anywhere between like 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 plaque forming units. So um, significantly higher than the median lethal dose of um, juvenile like whitefish exposed to viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus. So let's say that there are, you know, fish in the Great Lakes Basin. Um, again, the sh these shedding rates come from um, fish that were exposed in laboratory challenges, but Again, let's say that they are, there are wild fish shedding this virus at those rates. And if like white fish are in the, this proximity, um, I mean, it could devastate their population. Um, and in these studies too, the shedding rates were, you know, 10 to the five to 10 to the seven plaque forming units per fish per hour. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whole lot of 53s fit into 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So last call for any, any questions? And if not, Courtney, um, great job. And thank, thank you again to all of the attendees for tuning in. And um, we will now be moving into the, the closed door session here shortly. So... Um, but we'll take a moment. You can rest for a moment and you're getting lots of congratulations and virtual applause. So, so great job. And, and thank you again, everybody. Yep. Thank you, everyone. The, uh, the mass virtual exodus. Yep. <laughs> Okay, um, so Dr. Fitzgerald and Dr. Brendan, um, would you like to take a like a brief? Should we give? I know when these are in person, the student we usually take like a minute so they can get a drink or something, and then should we just reconvene in ten minutes or so, or does that work for you? Works for me. 
Scott, would, would that work for you? He, he may sure. have, yeah, he may have already taken a break. Okay, so yeah, Courtney, why don't we, why don't we plan on, how about we, we come back, we'll use the same link at 11.05. And okay. you don't necessarily have to log off, but. Oh, okay. Um, and I will. 11.05, okay. Yes. Should we, should we send a message to Dr. Fitzgerald in the chat? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it. Um, okay. I so will, I will put it in the chat that we're okay. reconvening it at 11.05. Okay, sounds good. Good job, Courtney. Thank you. Part one of the milestone <laughs> complete. Now, now closed door session, right? Yes. So make sure you get some, stretch your legs, get some water, eat a banana. All right. Will do. <laughs> All right, I'll see you in a little bit. Okay.